Um, so thanks a lot for, the, for having me. This is a great honor to, to be here. So I will present bits of, of my research that kind of informed the, the book has been kind of a journey of like 10 years that started with the PhD, then going back um, kind of um, regularly. Uh, and somehow also the book became something different than the thesis and so forth. So it was a 10 years of my life that's, um, and, and, and 10 years of, of the life of, of my interlocutors. And now they're happy uh, with me not asking questions anymore, but just hanging out with them. But, um, uh, so we'll tell you a little bit of the stories of, of the book and the people kind of populate them. And I look forward to uh, your questions. So um, mm -hmm. Ibrahim's life has been long um, um, and intense as he put it. When I met Ibrahim in 2010 for the first time, he was in his early thirties. He had recently got a job as a car attendant or as people say in Addis Ababa, a parking guy in a cooperative that the local government office had established for the unemployed youth. This initiative was no localized one, was part of a broader attempt by the government at the time uh, uh, to recapture the youth that participated in uh, the supported opposition parties in 2005 election and participated in the riots and demonstrations that followed. On top of his job, Ibrahim made extra money by brokering the sales of secondhand mobile phones in the past, they had had multiple engagement with both wage labor, especially construction work and informal street economy. So he'd been a street fighter, a skillful hustler and a thief, a manager of, a video, of informal video house or informal cinema, also a construction worker, a guard, an assistant carpenter, a stone worker, and for a short time, a successful uh, shoe seller. Ayla, now 50, uh, who also claimed to have lived a very long life. It's a very cool picture of him here. So he had been a student until 14 years of age, then a pickpocket, a burglar, and a daily laborer at construction sites. With the collapse of the Dirk, the socialist regime, the socialist military, the military junta that led the socialist regime between 1974 and 1991, when the regime collapsed, collapsed, he, like many other young people at the time, tried to make his way out of the country. At the age of 22, he spent nine months as a refugee in Kenya, but as soon as he realized he was not going to be able to leave the continent, he returned to Addis Ababa. A new succession of possible lives followed. He worked as a manager of video houses, so like informal cinema, then enlisted as a soldier in the 1998-2000 Ethiopian Eritrean War. After the war ended, Ayla returned to Addis Ababa. He stayed as a veteran, didn't however open up any particular social opportunities, and he found himself relying on his own means to get by, mainly on the streets. After a few years hustling on the streets, he was invited to join a government-supported cooperative, producing a precast concrete blocks for construction sites, for housing construction sites for the government. His work lasted as long as the government provided highly enterprise uh, with contracts. When the enterprise eventually closed down because the government stopped giving them contracts, Aile joined Ibrahim in the cooperative of parking guys to support himself and his son uh, that mostly lived with Aile's mother. So in this like two minutes, I give you just the synthesis of the whole book and the stories uh, that the book um, uh, tells uh, in, in, in few pages. But so how can we narrate and understand a life? This is kind of the main kind of questions I'll ask myself in the book as well. So ethnography has a valuable tradition in the writing of life histories and exploring the tension between individuality and the fact that existence is embedded in history, cultural notions, social relationships, and notably constraints. However, what to make of the lived experience is still an open question. I would argue that the challenge lies in our ability to explore how people conceptualize and experience the intimate relationship between life and the self. And my informants use two terms to make sense of this. One is Bahri, that is a, a unique character of an individual, and knowing one is Bahri, however, is not a matter of introspection. The Bari is a knowable, is knowable through others, in particular in the ways other people describe you and how you relate to them. Tabai instead is another term that what people is that people use the term that people use to make sense of what people have become through the experiences of one's life. You are what you have lived, also you can become what you have not lived yet. So being is not an essence or a stable position. But being is realized in practice and reworked through the process of endless becoming. 
So this understanding is not just existential philosophy that you know this might resonate with some of the authors, but it's an understanding of life trajectories that has a long history in Ethiopia, especially in the northern part of the country, where many communities have conceptualized the life of an individual as a continuum of social experiences from childhood to old age, and not uh, as a well-defined succession of life stages. So in the experience of my interlocutors uh, in NSCD others, seeing life as a continuum also resulted in appreciating life as an open moment. Seeing life as an open moment, however, is not just a matter of intellectual sophistication or the propensity of the ethnographer like myself who wants to be hopeful and impose idea of open-endedness into the life of his interlocutors. We can discuss in the questions, but also argue that uh, idea of open-endedness and see life as an open moment is an ethnographic uh, fact. In particular, in the ways the open-endedness of life and living can be seen, experienced, and understood by those we write about, uh, whether it's in Ethiopia or in Naples, or the work I'm doing right now, as a site for being something that other than one constraints. So how can we appreciate, however, the complex intertwining of becoming, meaning, politics, history, and everyday life we are often after when we look, uh, when we take living and life as the matter of ethnographic investigation. And how can we ethnographic accounts of open-endedness and life, uh, lives as open moments guide our critical appreciation of the present as well as by an anthropological contribution to the possibility of more just futures. So my, my other work more generally seeks to answer these questions and this book here has all the answers. So buy it. Uh, so this is the moment of, of, of commercial. But today I will fly below lower exploring life, meaning history and open-endedness and make a case for rethinking uh, how we understand experiences of marginality. In particular, uh, I criticize our tendency as a scholars or critical scholars uh, to rely on cunning phrasing, phrases, analytical styles, namely to find how the marginalized tend to reproduce the condition of marginality through their own action or even the forms of resistance. So I criticize this way of thinking, this very circular way of thinking. It all proposed an ethnographic critique of this uh, anthropological, sociological interpretation of visual cycles of action and reproduction. And I also we sketch out a reflection on the kind of politics that a closer engagement with an open-endedness um, or the tension of living, as I call it, the act of living can potentially inspire. So, um, Metnography appreciation of the act of living is contingent on a particular place, Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, or even someone can argue in a specific neighborhood in the inner city Addis, more generally defined, and time, what was called at the time the decade of Africa rising, more or less. And it's specific to the stories of two lives, more or less, with the particularities of gender, location, and upbringing. So the particularity of a given realization or given life, however, doesn't limit its relevance. The uniqueness of a story, as Hannah Arendt will put it, tells about the infinite potentialities of living and existence. At the same time, while even while unique, existence unfolds in places, times, and modes of being in the world that are shared and resonate with the experiences of a wide range of others. As my work here is about Haile Ibrahim, as much as the wider constituency of urban society they are part of why described as street life. Street life, however, is not just a synonym for whatever happens on the streets. Uh, while a street vendor might carry out his or her activities on the streets, it doesn't mean that she or she herself sharing lives and experiences and actions with others who also occupy the streets like street hustlers or sex workers. So what makes the difference between, um, um, between hanging out beyond the street and street life is the extent to which people inhabit the streets, recognize themselves as part of what the wider repertoire of memories, practices, collaboration, as well as antagonism that they describe as street life. In this case, in my own case of my research, revolving around hustling and street smartness. Also, while doing my research, uh, I also realized that I was occupying a specific sociological niche where standardized interpretation on waiting, weighthood, and various assumptions about social and political liminalities often linked to youth and the marginalized more generally 
these ideas didn't apply in my case. The reason why this interpretation do not apply is a particular sociological dimension of people acts of waiting that often goes unaccounted for. Those who wait are often those who can wait. In other words, waiting is viable for those who have access to an economy of exchanges, networks, and transactions that enable them to wait for what might be a better social opportunities and to time the unfolding of the existence towards desired social goals. For Haley Brahim and many others in this book, waiting was simply not an option. When you don't have much, my informants taught me, it doesn't make much sense to spend time wondering about the future you wish for and then wait for it to come. Last but not least, but you, you might already thought about this, this is a story of men. Economies of street hustling high inhabited by women and my wider research exploration of street hustling tell the story of players, smart women and sex workers. However, we also need to be aware that marginality is both produced and lived as a fundamentally agendered experience. For both serendipity and choice, I can talk more about this in the questions, um, I, uh, my ethnography uh, is an exploration of marginality within the gendered coordinates of the nexus between subjugation and subjectivities, looking at the way policies intervention also aim at particularly at regulating and controlling men's behavior in the cities and the country's political space. So this is a point that's very important also in the book, but helped, I'm happy to talk about in the questions. So pure chance dictated the highly brain were born in poor households in the city others. As with many of their friends, Ibrahim and Haile belong to the first generation of um, uh, Sababa born to families that were originated elsewhere. Their parents were among the many who migrated to the 1960s and 1980s and came to constitute the bulk of the capital's population. So as sons of uneducated rural immigrants at the bottom of urban society, Haile Ibrahim could hardly consider themselves to be well off. Yet the experiences of marginality didn't result inevitably from their parents' lack of means. Conversely, actually their parents had achieved uh, a small but valued social improvement relative to the, the radical scarcity of the rural areas where they came from. So in principle, being born in the city or within a trajectory of relative social improvement with access to an education from which the generation of their parents had been excluded from, Ibrahim and Haile were a step ahead of the previous generation. However, despite this clear advantage, Ali Brain soon found out that embarking on a trajectory of improvement, at least comparable to the one of their parents, was difficult or even impossible. As members of a generation that came to age between socialist regime and between the socialist regime and the APRDF, the previous government that was, um, you know, anti ruled the country in 2018, they were meant, however, to be beneficiaries of an expanding uh, education system. But the vision of progress and social mobility that long characterized discourses on education hardly reflect, reflected their experiences. As Ali put it, school was fake. It was a place to avoid rather than one where a vision of a better future could be cultivated. The brain remembered studying overcrowded classes led by underpaid and undermotivated teachers. Ibrahim's neighbor Yibel Tal, a minibus, minibus driver, echoed many disenchanted, resentful recollection of school days. He said, teachers were cold. However, engaging in the legal, in the legal illegal street economy in Al Sababa in a city provided Ibrahim and Aile with ways of getting by. Getting by, however, we should not be simply considered as a generic attempt to survive, but spending time on the streets when they were young, in a way, these men over the period of their lives built their networks as well elaborated the sense of self-worth uh, revolving around the ideas and practices of inner city uh, street smartness characterized as being Arada. So Arada is the name of inner city where Haile Ibrahim lived, where I carried out most of my research. However, this idea of being Arada in Arada uh, was not just a matter of homonymy. For my interlocutors, being Arada voiced the deep fascination that they felt with the ability of the hustler to make do, and importantly, with ease of her capacity to live smartly and toughly through a condition of marginality and exclusion in the city. However, this is not an entire story, so gonna be a bit ethnographic here. Since the 1960s, being Arada, they noted the sociality that pervaded at the suburb of cafes, bars, and restaurants. So any, as any city residents were ready to argue, not all Arada were the same, and not all Aradas could equally claim to be true Arada. 
So the white gentleman arada o in amarik dembanya arada and thag aradas in amarik duriya arada. So dembanya in amarik means customer, buyer, or even patron. And dembanya arada convey the sense of properness, manners, gallantry, and style that made the person a proper arada. So being a proper arada embodied the idea of sophistication that an emerging urban middle class made up of students, intellectuals, artists, singers, members of the aristocracy, even government officials, claim for themselves the symbols of the distinctiveness between especially in the 1940s and the mid 1970s. So Duriye meanwhile is Damaric for thug. Uh, Duriye Rada reflected the fact that the, the street life and the street economy existed alongside the society of gentlemen, let's say, and the ideas of sophistication and properness. For my interlocutors among hustlers and thugs, a pickpocket, a con artist, and a robber are a rada because they master street smartness and street knowledge. And there are street tourist guides, for instance, told me, a rada are the ones who understand other people. Pickpocket is a smart way of being a rada. First, you have to understand the brain of the person and also his, his body, then you will choose your target. Similarly, when if he, he brain off reminded me, a smart person could also be a criminal. So mid class, middle class, sorry, ideas of, yes, middle class ideas of uh, urban sophistication and tax street smartness represented two different ways of conceptualizing being a rada or being urban. Between gentlemen, the Dembenya rada and thugs, the Duriya rada, there is a long history of differentiation and exclusion, a history that made being and becoming a rada so central for both uh, gentlemen and middle class strategies of distinction and the ways also inner city marginalized men in particular sought to navigate the condition of exclusion. In these circumstances, being and becoming rather offered highly brave and generation of inner city, uh, sorry, inner city uh, generation of inner city men, ways of asserting their presence in the urban space and encouraging action amidst exclusion. At the same time, they faced the predicament. They granted the actions in flirtations with street violence in engagement with illicit activities and sometimes criminal offenses. However, street life appealed to men like Haile Ibrahim not because it gave them an opportunity to, to be violent or masculine. Street life gave marginalized men a way of asserting their presence in the city while obtaining a certain degree of respect, recognition, even fame on the streets and in the community. Pointing out our involvement in street life, the live respect, doesn't mean endorsing toughness and street violence as a legitimate grounds for action. Conversely, it means recognizing the existential quest behind it. With Franz Fanon, I read appeal of crime, hustling, street violence for Haile Ibrahim and many others in inner city is embedded in the search for somewhere else and for something else. As Fanon analogies, this is not a joke. It can be a struggle in, what, in which one must be willing to accept the convulsions of death, invincible dissolution, but also the possibility of the impossible. I argued in this temptation to play with the possibility of the impossible, appeal to highly brain and generational marginalized men before them. Involvement in street life gave them an opportunity to experiment with what a poor person could be and could do, possibility in the face of a condition of marginality they could hardly challenge, what we say impossibility. Being a rather gave them a language not to question poverty and exclusion, something impossible, but to live bravely and smartly through it. So at the end of the 1990s, Brahim and Haile experienced the street life culminated with the making of their group, was called uh, Yemot Bedip. This is what I just said, sorry. Uh, those were dust, destined to die. The group gained certain fame on the streets. Indeed, its name was not uh, self-assumed. People in the neighborhood called them because of the defiant style, smoking ganja and heavy drinking, as well as the ability to navigate Arada illegal street economy. So Yemot Bidib, uh, like many other street groups in the history of the Sababa, that's uh, the book kind of tells their history, didn't last for long. But early 2000s, just a couple of years after the group was formed, some of its members met the destiny spelled in the name of the group, those who are destined to die. Wube was among the youngest in, group, in the group. He was uh, just 19 when he was found hanged from the ceiling of his house. Samson and Stefano soon followed the spread of HIV AIDS that eat Arada in the between the late 1990s and early 2000s. And members of the Yemot Bedib went not only over to die during those years, important pieces of the history of the streets of Arada were vanishing under the acts of illness, violent death, and government repression. 
So looking back to these days, uh, Ibrahim and Hali remember the death of their close friends seem both like a warning about the risk inherent in living a tough life and a push to, to find a way out of street life. At such moments, the attainment of respect and recognition in the streets was felt less as an achievement and more as a predicament. So this is the moment when I, when I come in into the story in a way when I met I meet, uh, Haile Ibrahim. While Ibrahim and his friends, you know, starting from the mid, early mid 2000s, while Ibrahim and his friends have been struggling to change their life and trying to find a way out of, of street life, the Ethiopian economy was booming. And the capital of the uh, capital city of Sababa was witnessing a dramatic transformation. In the early 1990s, business reports and media accounts portrayed Africa and Ethiopia's uh, poverty as a threat to rich countries. 20 years later, so the time like 2010 and so forth, Africa's economic growth was described as bringing the promise of an ongoing expansion of opportunities for investment and wealth creation across the globe. You cannot afford to not invest in Ethiopia, a foreign investor told the Ethiopian Business Review. However, growth has not been for all, social inequalities have been on the rise and the ability of ordinary citizens to affect policy um, uh, is, is significantly limited. So economic growth and development had offered Ali Ibrahim and many others in the city others nothing to build on to meaningfully change their lives. For most of their lives, they have occupied the lower tiers of the street economy and in some moments, wage labor, combining hustling with construction work. The world of alleged business, meanwhile, was for the most part too distant in the horizon of their possibility. In my interlocutors reckoning, the economy was dominated by the logic that relatives are with relatives and donkeys are with ashes. Zemed Kazemedu and Naya Kamdu. That is to say, people are connected and likely to help each other while leaving those who are outside the networks with nothing more than ashes. Development and, and participation, the keywords of government approach, at least the previous regime, to urban poverty since the mid 2000s soon became part of the problem. The cooperatives of parking guys Ali Brain worked for when I meet, met them were part of a broader political strategy of the PRDF, the, the party that ruled the country between 1991 and 2018. Um, the, the strategy to aim at capturing what was described as the, as the unemployed youth after a period of intense political conflict starting around 2005, a period of struggle that resulted in the death of 200 people in Addis Ababa and the detention of 30,000 in the capital and other major towns in 2005. Ibrahim and Ayla were among the many who joined government entrepreneurship programs in the years following those riots, either out of a fear of imprisonment or to make ends meet or both. By joining these programs, Ayla Ibrahim gained a regular monthly income, but also became dependent on the government and the ruling party for their survival. Even though they were not supporters of the previous ruling party, they understood that at the time when I was doing this research, they understood that if they wanted to keep their jobs, they were expected and did require to act as supporters and show up in meetings and rallies. The implementation of development programs enabled the ruling party at the time to expand its reach into the population, mobilizing a significant number of people. At the same time as the parking guys in government supported cooperatives, Ali Ibrahim still could not embark on trajectory of social mobility. They continue to be marginal actors of the cities and inner city economies while experiencing the increasing pervasiveness of the ruling party apparatus or political control in their lives. So meanwhile, in the inner city, the ability of hustlers to seize this moment of growth and development has resulted in a questioning of the actual smartness of the street arada. As an increasing number of people turn towards the vision of abundance of wealth that the city offered with its high rise buildings and spectacular large infrastructure to elaborate ideas of desirable and achievable futures, my interlocutors witnessed a widening questioning of their claims to smartness and aradaness. Many in the city have begun, have begun to argue already while I was doing my research that the Arada are no longer those who just live smartly through poverty and scarcity as Harry Brain tried to do, but those who are smart enough to get away from it. In this emerging conceptualization, the Rada are those who become rich, not those who remain poor. Now, if you are chista, um, kind of slang term to say broke, nobody's going to respect you, Ibrahim told me. Access to the inner city business community was closed and development programs failed, continue to fail to provide opportunities for social improvement. However, while the condition of marginality persisted, the construction of high-rise buildings has increased availability of resources and goods 
triggered expectation and desire for social mobility and material success. Al Ibrahim were fascinated by the promises of abundance that city economic growth offered, yet the persistence of their own marginality made them wonder about the actual foundation of, of, the, of this of wealth, success, and power in the country, something that was for them both inexplicable and hence potentially moral. If you're rich, there is something behind you. Ayla often told me, moving his hands as if we're writing a question mark in the air. People I talked to saw development economic growth as a bluff, and they felt they could not join such a bluff. Sure, they were hustling, and bluffing is the domain of the hustler, but also felt that they didn't have the resources to play the big game of faking and cheating that they saw rich people playing. As Ibrahim put it, we are chabeta, we are squeezed. We gamble with no money, we don't have opportunities, we don't have a past, a present, and a future. There was a big divide between the small hustling of the survivors and the big cheating of the wealthy, and the divide they felt could not be crossed. This critical account was far from nuanced and was often grounded in rumors and perception. However, it was a powerful moral indictment of the logic of the relatives with relatives and donkeys with ashes that produced a condition of exclusion, that they felt produced a condition of exclusion. Yet, such kind of critique can be potentially mobilizing. On the streets of inner city, the heaviness of the constraints imposed on my interlocutors' action were often so overwhelming that immobility, self-destruction, even death appear, appeared to some inevitable, and some tragically succumbed to this. The death of Fantaun came as a huge shock when I was doing my research. Fantaun was in the mid-20s, spoke very good French, they learned that the Alliance Francaise Many people among his friends and acquaintances know that he was a heavy drinker and they should take care of, but he did not. He kept drinking Arakia, a very strong log of brandy, and for this many reasons, many people thought he died. His death was taken as a consequence of chinket, uh, stress. He was thinking too much. We can read this in many ways. One, I can argue that Brahim and many others were dealing with overwhelming uncertainty and precariousness of their existence the reason why the stress and anxiety they felt. Uncertainty pertains to our ability to know or even to predict the outcome of events. In such a condition of not being able to know what is going to be next has been described as a predicament and a condition of risk and vulnerability. For my interlocutors, however, uncertainty was actually not a concern. Uncertainty was perceived as enabling them to think of their lives and the condition of poverty and exclusion is not the final, no irreversible. What was actually known was often bleak and overwhelmingly distressing because it didn't give them grounds for imagining a better life. Pain, anxiety, and madness were interpreted by my interlocutors as a result of people's potential obsession with making sense of what they saw, knew, and experienced. So friends who had died or gone mad or or drank themselves out of existence, as Ibrahim put it, were the most traumatic reminder of the potential consequence of too much thinking. For Ibrahim, for instance, appealed to his ability to forget. Say, it's nice that you think about what you have to do, but don't do it too much. Uh, people get crazy for much thinking. I like my brain is incredible. I can forget things. This makes things easier. Forgetting was co a component of a, was a, form, was a, a form of social reflexivity or a discipline of the self it was grounded in the recognition that we are thrown into the world without much control of the circumstances of our existence. For my interlocutors, the existential choice was not, to, was not to be or not to be, but to do something or to do nothing. And being in the world or slipping away from it through madness or death was perceived to be dependent on this dilemma. For, for my interlocutors, not knowing what's going to be next was a reason to have hope. What they hoped for was to achieve a change though how they wanted their lives to change was left generic and unspecified. My interlocutors not, not just a particular vision of the good life, like the one typified by the high rise uh, um, steel and glass buildings dotting at the side of our landscape. However, the search for grounds for action and hope in the face of marginality were not linked to imagine, were not linked to imaginations of the good life. They did dream about wealth and success but they didn't spend much time thinking about the, what their lives could be. Visions of good life were rarely imagined as actual plans to pursue in the present and the future. The possibility of achieving a better life in the future was dependent on chances and not dreams. In the understanding of ch a chance or rather getting a chance stood at the junction between the lives that lived in the past, the contingency of the present and indeterminacy of the future. 
a chance is a stroke of fortune, an event or a series of events which is unpredictable, or when it happens, will take your life in a direction you have not have expected. Those my interlocutors turn to, um, to the future, not for looking for a specific and well-defined form of success, but for a chance that might take them away from the condition of poverty and exclusion. Interestingly, while the idea of success and change is unspecified and vague, the notion of chance, a deal in Amharic, is grounded in a deep configuration of meanings revolving around relationship with God as well as morality. A chance is a gift of God and as such dependent on his inscrutable will. Hence, it might be argued that predictability of existence is therefore an expression of the inscrutability of God and the Father of what will happen only God knows. Is Gabriel Yaukal in Amharic. Yet this doesn't mean that individuals are powerless. My informants believe that the, what they could do was to cultivate the good relationship with God by signaling their loyalty to him with praise and religious acts and by showing with their God good conduct to be worthy of good goodwill. Gaining good favor, my informants knew, was not an easy thing to do. They had stolen, cheated, and hustled on the street, and this they were aware of was not something they could be proud of in front of God. How could they reconcile their bad conduct with their attempts to gain the favor of God? One way was to gain cultivate a good relationship with God through religious acts, going to church, there were Orthodox Christians, or being committed to know about Islam as Muslim Ibrahim did. However, on top of their commitments to religious life, my informed interlocutors also turned to an exercise of moral reflexivity. The conversation I had with them about how they evaluated their deeds echoed what, what philosophers have debated about moral lack whether or not what people do in situations outside their control can be an object of moral judgment. For my interlocutors, the bad acts were a result of the contingency of their life, as such not subject to clear moral judgment. They didn't choose to be poor, and they believe that when you are poor, you need to do what you need to do in order to get by. But recognizing the lim limits of the action, or rather by arguing they didn't have control of the circumstances of their lives, my informants thought of themselves as moral subjects, he could rightfully, could rightfully claim a chance from God. At the same time, these young men were aware they still had work to do on the religious side, feelings of regret and a certain level of commitment to religious life were considered to be central to cultivating a good relationship with God while still claiming to be moral subject because of the adverse circumstances of their lives. On the other, however, being able to get the chance of fundamentally a matter of inhabiting the contingency of their lives. As my informants put it, it was a matter of moving around in Kazakhstan, say, as my, and my informants kept moving. The cooperative parking guys, for instance, is still there, uh, was still there when I went there in the early 2020, is still there now when I talk to, to Haile Ibrahim. But many of its members, including Haile Ibrahim, have been trying to find a way out of it, either by finding the placements for their own work um, um, and continue to receive a share of the profit because this is a cooperative, or by asking the government to give them part of the capital the cooperative had, had saved. Ibrahim, for instance, for a while found a replacement to work for him at the cooperative, handing him two thirds of his salary at the end of the month and keeping the difference, so one third. This gave him more time, enabled him to combine his one third salary with the second hand mobile phone business. Um, when we actually we made the calculation at the end, his income was not very different from the one he made he had kept working full time in the cooperative, but the arrangement made him feel free to consider other options. As a brain put it, Marco, you know me, I cannot be just like this, just doing one thing. I eventually quit the cooperative um, without getting a share of the capital he has saved over the years. He decided, he decided to put resources with his sister to give an, uh, or to open a little container shop like the ones you see in the picture within the government scheme, scheme for small scale commercial activities. In 2015, Haile was talking about his family shop with pride and excitement. He was selling small items from chewing gums to bottles of water. However, by 2017, Haile moved uh, about his family shop had radically changed. He realized that the family shop has simply replaced one meager income with another. The prospect of achieving the life part two, as he put it, of social and economic improvement for himself and his little son was still out of reach. Yet my informants kept moving. So talking about the challenges that, um, that he had countered getting by on the streets and trying to become something other that war had been assigned to him by birth, Ibrahim told me, Marco, living is the most important thing. You know, this life, we live it. 
for Ibrahim and many others were stories I tell in the book, living was important because staying alive was the ultimate condition for being able to turn the unexpected and, the, uh, and uncertain into possibility. The experience of being alive gave them the sense they still had time to pursue trajectories that were different from the destiny of poverty to which they felt their lives might be headed. Living contained the seeds of open-endedness, possibility and reversibility, since while we live, no final judgment can be made of who we are and what our lives have been about. So philosophers just, just as Agamben uh, have argued that the desire to be and to persist is easily exploited and exploitable. This is because he argues the subject attachment to life contains a fundamental predicament. When life assumes an intrinsic value and survival becomes the main concern of the subject, the individual is caught in the mechanism governing the reproduction of regimes of political oppression and capitalist production. Similarly, we could read my informant's search for penendence as illusory, fatalistic, or worse, a certain form of false consciousness. If you would like to argue this, please be my guest. There is a long tradition of sociological and philosophical thought that as other portray people's desire as an impediment to action or seen limited purpose in investigating how social actors understand the meanings of the action. Building on this tradition, literary scholar Lauren Barlin wrote in a book, Cruel Optimist and Modes of Existence, the late literary scholar Lauren Barlan, um, uh, she argued that modes of existence potentially comparable to the stubbornness of keep moving uh, or existential discipline the mind interlocutors embrace to seek open-endedness are for her symptoms of an attachment to visions of desire of a better few life, which are cruel because waiting long weekly in their obstacles to actual ability to achieve one's dreams. Boudio, for instance, would argue that Hazard Ali Ibrahim moved around the choices they made and the trajectories they embarked on to pursue their quest for social mobility, wittingly or wittingly, willy-nilly, contributed to reproduction of the condition of marginality um, and exclusion. I see uh, messages coming uh, up, sorry, just, um, uh, sorry, just, I, I will keep, uh, I see there are questions there. So this interpretation of life, of my, uh, of my life, of my, my informants, by indeed, someone can argue partly correct. As with the crack dealers in New York, described by Philippe Bour Bourgois, street hustlers and Arada were faced with the fact that um, uh, the engagement with hustling and cheating, smartness and toughness had not taken them anywhere other than poor neighborhoods in inner city others. However, I kind of, I'm against this interpretation and don't assume that, um, that my informant's sense of the possible coincides with the social position or that this coincidence is independent, is independent variable in the reproduction of their condition of exclusion. I argue that while the sense of what people can do or cannot do is elaborated through the experience of power relations, it doesn't mean the constraints imposed on them are internalized as given and natural. Instead, we should inhabit uh, analytic and ethnographic detention that pervade the existence of our interlocutors. The subject, the subject attempt to be and become something other than their constraints while living in an existence that is firmly embedded in the experience of a subjugation and exclusion. In a way there is a tension, in a way the opposition between, to say in a classic terms, in a position of being structure and agency uh, fails us here. The structured agency debates remains un unresolved because the tension that discussion seeks to make sense of don't have an historical final sentences. The tension of the structure agency is a tension and we should describe as such. This is a tension that emerged from the fact that the subject is neither fully determined by power nor fully determining of power, as Judith Butler will say. This tension and ambivalence remains fundamentally unresolved, making the experience of trying to be something else than the one constraints, as Fanon observed a long time ago, a painful one because of stress, anxiety, suffering, and, and, and strain. Yeah, as this tension endures unresolved because of people's stubborn acts of moving around, is a fertile terrain for elaborating a repertoire of practices for living, assessing, criticizing, hiding, and bypassing. Instead, this, this, so these acts are embedded in a, a, a exercise, everyday exercise of reflexivity through which people position themselves in society, seek to act morally, and live meaningfully. So, so what? The usual questions are also my supervisor when I was writing my PhD always ask me, and also now that I've become a supervisor myself, I always ask this question to myself and to my students. So what? So when I published my book in uh, 2019, 
Ethiopia was going through a process of political reform led by the then new prime minister, Abiy Ahmed. Back then, members of opposition parties had been released from prison and restrictions on the media and civil society were lifted, resulting in a wave of optimism and hope across the country. Three, three, year, three years after Abiy Ahmed appointment, the political situation has drastically deteriorated, increasing ethnic violence and political friction, first with the Romo nationalists and then the military confrontation between the Tigray People Liberation Front, the former lead party in the FRDF, which had refused to merge into Abiy Abi political vehicle, the Prosperity Party. This all circumstances have created a climate of, of volatility with members of opposition party and critical media in prison and street protests suppressed uh, earlier in the early years, political space is again closing. He's a good speaker, but if you ask me, it's like when you move your teapot from one fire to another. Ibrahim told me already in May, 2018, when I was in Addis, reflecting much of the skepticism that already populated the streets in NSCD Addis about um, the regime change. That's at the time it was no regime change. So when I was at the suburb of back in, in, again in early 2020, many others uh, continue to be skeptic about the regime change as it didn't necessarily result in a proliferation of chances they could indeed boost the search for open-endedness. So in this circumstance, even more, I condemn that my interlocutor's understanding of the act, act of living is central here. Haile Ibrahim and many others learn to understand that living in the city is revolving around the efforts to achieve a form of relative yet significant improvement. They expected to be better placed than their parents and they hoped to enable their children to live a better life than they did. Both Haile Ibrahim had children and Haile was very uh, committed and caring father. So the search, the search, is, the search that oh, keep moving around in a way was an attempt to fulfill a generational duty of incremental improvement. As my informants put it, life is about living, having left your place to another, as they put in Amharic, this attempt to fulfill this generational duty of incremental improvement not only produced the kept moving that I described, or this idea of open-endedness, but also generated claims and demands. Over the years I spent investigating in the city, others, I witnessed how Ali, Ibrahim, and many others expressed claims and demands to NGOs and government institutions that were promptly, promptly unaddressed. From giving a pot of money to each member of the parking guys cooperative to launch their own ventures in the informal economy, to replacing doom life skill training programs into employment oriented initiatives focused on cooking or driving, all of them cast aside because considered to be either impossible to achieve or irrelevant. So I believe that ethnography can potentially question this politics of impossibility and relevance. Pursuing responsiveness to these claims will, and this search for open-endedness and fulfill generational duty of uh, continuous improvement will imply questioning that long held idea that the main objectives of social policy and development are to change poor people's minds, penalize the unworthy and the lazy and to help the deserving poor uh, help themselves out of poverty. Responsiveness rests on the idea that tackling poverty and exclusion requires a collective effort to question the political and social hierarchies of worth which produce subjugation and, and exclusion. So telling and sharing stories like the ones like Hali Ibrahim, I hope, can potentially be a call for a politics that targets people as members of a society and not as bearers of some form of either commensurable or reprehensible morality. Responding to these claims and demands will entail a commitment to reshape politics and policies. And this is not just around grand visions of the future, as my informants understood it with a quest for a chance, there is not much point in prefiguring a vision of the future. It didn't work for them, it doesn't work when vision of the future or grand development future function as a justification for growing social inequality in the present. Inequalities are often uh, in the present are often justified as an inevitable step towards the future. So responding to claims and demands, perhaps rather than lacking at the present, is the only measure to understand uh, the effectiveness of policy or our own ideas of development. Eventually, what is required is the elaboration of a method that can get us closer to the realization of something better. And when that better is not just to trade off uh, between inequalities in the present and the idea vision of the future, but something imagined and realized openly, collectively, 
within the tangible origins, the presence, addressing those claiming demands that I talked about, reach the moment potentially when a world, a uh, better world is coming to be. And, and I argue as anthropologists, scholars, ethnographers, we definitely have a role uh, to play. So I'm happy to talk about this in the questions. Looking forward to your questions and thanks a lot for your patience and thanks a lot for listening.